soon as this whole documentary expedition project actually began to start to coalesce and become something, really started to come together, uh, realized that we really needed a team to sort of tackle this project. And especially as a filmmaker, as somebody who wanted to document the project, I needed some backup. And Connor from the Stanley Hotel, Connor Randall, is one of my best friends. He's really brilliant mind in the paranormal, does tons of great research. and. Basically, like I wanted to be able to bring him alongside as my right-hand man to be able to engage in this case and the research of the case and go along and support the project uh, from that perspective and having that ability that I wasn't necessarily always able to do by directing this and being behind the camera and thinking about the story and then thinking about the investigation. And then I wanted to reach out to Rashad Sizemore, who's my cameraman, basically. He's worked in the, the film industry for uh, a couple of years now, and he's always been very passionate about photography and video and documentary filmmaking. So that that team right there, I mean, ultimately there was five of us out there trekking around and that became a very core team. Carl is one of my best friends. We worked together for many years on various paranormal cases, uh, most frequently up at the Stanley Hotel in Estes Park, Colorado, where we were two out of three resident paranormal investigators along with Michelle Tate. Uh, we know each other very well. Um, we know our different investigative styles very well. And we've spent so many hundreds of hours in dark places investigating with each other that um, we know the methods that work best for us. Um, Carl is a fantastic asset because he has a really great eye, not only for a good shot or for cinematic details, but for really paying close attention to what's going on. Um, Carl's a keen observer and we use that to our advantage when we're, when we're doing investigations. Carl's a little bit quieter than I am. He's a little bit more introspective and that's part of the reason why we work so well as a duo together. Um, because I'm ready to just dive in and talk to everybody and anybody. And Carl is the one who will sit back, sort of take a step back and look at the bigger picture. So when Carl called me up, I was, I was ready to go to Kentucky. We met Carl a couple years back at the Stanley Hotel. Uh, we'd always kind of heard about him and we'd seen a lot of his work and we really liked some of the stuff that he'd been working on. Uh, we thought that Spirits of the Stanley was one of the coolest web series we'd ever seen. It was shot really well. Uh, they were doing really cool experiments that other people weren't doing. And so when Carl was like, hey, I heard this podcast about the goblins. Let's go and, and do this. Let's cover this. Let's go back to the town. Uh, Carl was probably one of the only people who could make me go, all right, sure, let's go. Um, the, the alien cave base task force was a joke at the time. And there were a lot of people who wanted to be on it and go and investigate these things. But when Carl showed interest in it, I was like, okay, all right, you, you pulled my leg, let's go, let's go do it. Uh, Connor, we hadn't really spent a whole lot of time with. So Connor was kind of a new entity that had come into the mix. And uh, we'd known him a little bit from watching Spirits of the Stanley. So we kind of had a, a little bit of an idea of what to expect of him. Um, and the fact that both of these guys have uh, a really interesting take on the paranormal and what instigates paranormal phenomena and how to investigate paranormal phenomena. Uh, they were the perfect types of people to add to the mix. Um, they are probably, and I can't tell if this is because they're a little younger than us, but they're probably a little more skeptical than Data and I are in our old age. You suddenly get to this weird point when you're an investigator where you're just like, let me have it, let's go. I want the weirdest thing you can throw at me. So sometimes it's good to have people who have uh, a little bit of sharper skeptic edge on them when you go looking for something like goblins. For a good two weeks, three weeks before we got in the car and went out to Kentucky, basically since around the time that this started to solidify, that Greg and I got on the phone and we put some dates down and we tried to schedule it, the synchronicities started to show up again. Uh, 
in force, no less. And once again, they were all revolving around this case. And there was being foundations for synchronicities being set during that time that we wouldn't even recognize until later on in the expedition. It was like the, the case woke up again, where it had sit dormantly for about a, a year or two since the last kind of update that they had. It seemed like as soon as we put it on the calendar, all these people woke up to the case again. Greg started getting emails uh, from people who were interested in adapting it for TV. He was getting emails from uh, readers of the blog who wanted to know the coordinates to Brown Mountain. I mean, like a week, a week before our expedition was planned, he and Dana were called up super last minute to go speak um, at CryptidCon, which they were already going to be at, but they were called up last minute to uh to give a second lecture about the kentucky goblins case so i mean this is a case that just seemed to instantly come back flooding in their lives again with all these little pieces coming up and these synchronicities really began to ramp up as we went I honestly think the thing about synchronicities for the most part is that they're meant to capture your attention for some reason. And I think that we try to look at what the synchronicity is and pick it apart and understand what exactly it means when really for the most part, I think it's kind of a surface thing to a certain extent. I personally find that when I'm experiencing a lot of synchronicities, it's usually during a really important time where either something in my life is changing or something around me is changing. So I'm like hyper aware of them. And I think that's what they're there for. I think it's to keep our brain out of kind of settling into that mundane autopilot brain that like a majority of people are just sort of living at all the time. From the start, I've compared this case to the Mothman Prophecy story, uh, which was John Keel's massive research project for about two years in Point Pleasant, West Virginia, documenting all of the strange, strange UFOs and cryptid stuff that were, were happening in that town for the time period of about 1967 to 1968. It's a story that I've always kind of held like close to me. Like it's such a bizarre case that I think any anyone who's fascinated by this high strangeness would read that book and say like, I, where is my Point Pleasant? Like where is my story that I can I can get lost in that weirdness and have these encounters one after another that just blow the mind. And so from the start with this Goblins case in Kentucky, I felt like this is kind of a Point Pleasant case. I downloaded it on audiobook to listen to for the drive out. because I love having an audiobook to, to make a drive a little faster. And we really had no idea how much that was going to come into play later on throughout the next two weeks. One of the most bizarre encounters in this entire Mothman Prophecy story was the tale of Woodrow Derenberger, who was a local sewing machine salesman who was driving home from work one night. This UFO runs him off the highway, forces him to pull over, and this entity steps out of the craft. As soon as I had stopped, there was a door opened in the side of this vehicle, and this man stepped out and came directly to me 
And this man stood there, and he, uh, he first asked me what I was called. And I knew he meant my name, and I told him my name. And uh, he asked me, he said, uh, why are you frightened? He said, don't be frightened. We wish you no harm. I told him my name, and when I told him my name, he said he was called Cold. Now, this was the first of many encounters that Woodrow Derenberger had with this entity named Indrid Cold. And it kind of became characteristic story. It, it became one of those extremely odd encounters with these ultra terrestrial figures where half of it sounds utterly absurd and ridiculous, but the other half is very grounded in UFO lore. It was a, a really odd detail and an extremely odd story. So as we're driving down to Hellier, we've got about a four or five hour drive. And for me, it's a great opportunity to flip through the hard copy file that Greg has on this entire strange case so far. All the emails, all the correspondences, all the book excerpts. I start flipping through, and one of the documents I start reading is the Terry Rist interview from the appendix of Alan Greenfield's Secret Cipher, the Euphonauts book. In it, Terry Rist starts off talking about the cipher that the book's all about. The cipher is this weird coded cipher from Aleister Crowley, in fact, that some ultra terrestrial channeled through him in the 1920s, the 19 teens in Cairo, Egypt. They didn't crack the cipher for like 60 years, all these occultists, it took them that long. So as I'm reading through, these words jump out at me. And then suddenly you can see this little light bulb go off above Carl's head and he turns and he goes, there's ink and black. What the fuck? He says ink and black? Yeah, it's in the bold right here. 112 equals ink and black. <laughs> Greenfield's whole philosophy was that this code is how these ultra terrestrials are communicating with other people through what we're doing. And then now we can intercept that code. And apparently, one of the hobbies that Terry Rist had taken up was applying this cipher to the Point Pleasant Mothman case. And so when he applies this cipher to Indrid Cold's name, he assumes that Indrid Cold is a code phrase. He applies the cipher to it, he gets this coded information out of it, and what he interprets is basically directions to Indrid Cold's location presently in at that point, must have been the mid to late 80s, probably. He goes and walks up to this house and meets Indrid Colt, apparently. And Greenfield, commenting on this, says, was Indrid Colt a black guy? And Greenfield says, yeah, you know, he's commonly referred to as a blonde alien, but there's no race implications of a blonde alien. That's just a term. So yeah, how'd you, how'd you guess that he was black? And Greenfield says, well, one of your code words that you distilled from injured cold was ink and black. So I kind of took the next step. And Terry Riss says, very good. The most unusual point was his claim that they had been invited to take refuge on Earth by the Third Order. Humans and post-humans who are advanced enough to qualify as Earth's representatives in space-based governments. So that's what the Third Order is. They're humans and advanced human creature types who represent the Earth on like the space, astral, intergalactic, crazy alien, like real crazy shit that this is like hinting at. Like reptilian theorist types, like all the ones that have like sketched out the whole fucking mythology of these things. So Riz says, right. This was a distress beacon disguised as a contact episode. The whole Mothman thing was a distress beacon that failed. Greenfield says, so the whole mystery can be decoded in this way? Bruce says, probably. So, so now the email where it says, Hellier was just a symptom. The ink and the black are isolated still at Third Order's MIA. He's saying Indrid Cold is still isolated and that the Third Order still hasn't reached out to save Indrid Cold from the evil greys and shit. Like, that's what that, that means. <laughs> that's what that means. Bear in and mind. the moment you read through all that, Terry Rist's second email 
makes all the sense in the world. Obviously. This cryptic, obscure email suddenly is directly related to the Mothman prophecies. Indrid Cole. All right. So you go in here. They're talking about Woodrow Derenberger and the Mothman prophecy stuff. And they get to this point where there's some sort, like he basically took the name Indrid Cold and he did like a big cipher on it. Mm -hmm. And this 112 number is like some sort of cipher code to like break his name somehow, all like occult stuff. And 112, he says, breaks down to we are one, which is a code phrase that tells you you're important territory. But it also breaks into thy wife, letter, words and signs, ink and black. Oh, and all house of God, the wheel. So ink in the black is referring to injured cold, who's a black guy in this case. So when he come here in 20, 2013, he says injured cold is still isolated. The third order is still MIA, hasn't talked to him. And use the numbers. So it's like, again, like I said, like this information was out there at this point. Mm -hmm. So like, yeah. again, someone could have just been like, I'm yeah, going to yeah, be Terry Wrist. Yeah. Yeah. All right. For like, sure. I mean, you can put right. together what he's kind of talking but about. The only other weird part is he knows the name, which exactly. we never, ever did anything. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So to have that just like add a little bit of weight that like could have been fake, but like that's just that extra little bit. It was a really, really weird fringe thing to have be part of that email. And in that moment, it suddenly became part of, of wider fringe phenomena that had been occurring since the 50s. Uh, things that were investigated by some of the most famous heads of, of paranormal investigation. So John Keel was now intertwined in all of the stuff that we were looking into. Somebody knew what we were doing, they knew what we were looking into, and they clearly were giving us some kind of clue. Uh, there was something specific that they wanted us to investigate. Um, and then once Carl noticed the references and it all made sense, uh, it was really hard to think it was just somebody messing around. Driving to town is pretty desolate. Um, you know, the nearest city is like 30 minutes away. And going there, there's really not much. Uh, a lot of the times the road is really small, uh, really windy, and there's a certain feeling of isolation. I mean, it's unmistakable. There's, it's really not going to anywhere and not coming from anywhere. First, you have to go in between all of these giant highway pillars that have just been left. Um, unconstructed and unfinished. You start to get the feeling that the town has really been, I don't want to say forgotten, but it, the highway was literally going to go right over the top of it. So there's no reason that anybody would go there. There's really like one central hub in Hellier uh, that we found, and it's a little gas station. And the gas station doubles as a grocery store and a pizza place. 
it's really where everyone's at and you can kind of see that people are coming and going all the time. The woman we were looking for. It's like our primary contact lady that was most into it last time. Um, wasn't working at night. So we're gonna reach out to her over email and then phone and just kind of like hang out in this spot, maybe see what we can like, stir up. The, my first impressions of Hellier the first night when we showed up were a lot like our very first experience in Hellier. It was um, not a pleasant feeling. It's not a comfortable place to be. So um, for the most part, my first response to it was, again, similar to the, the first time we were there. I was, I was uncomfortable, I, like very apprehensive about being there and, and uh, hyper aware of myself being in this environment. Uh, and I think part of it also is that there's just a weird feeling to Hellier. It feels weird. Like you drive into it and it's an overwhelming, like weird vibe. And I, I think that that's part of also what, what you're feeling when you're there, especially if you you haven't lived there your whole life. Pretty quickly, we can all feel some eyes on us. Um, but we were on a mission. So we had to ask questions and we did. We dove right into it. Uh, just kind of shooting it with the locals and the guy, uh, said he, he was like, oh, there's lots of weird stuff, but mostly zombies, sure. kind of making a joke about the people around here. What's up, man? We're doing we're viral. <laughs> <laughs> pictures, right? So yeah. So this is what we're here checking out. This is why we're in town. So there's one. There's a couple of the tracks. And then we kind of give you an idea how big it is. Yeah. And then he says, this is one of the creatures. I don't know. I'm not Tough real shot. outdoorsman or anything, Tough but shot. I... Hmm. I ain't never seen nothing. Nothing like this? No. Never heard any stories about weird things in caves and mines? Not really. Nothing? No. Nah. You know anybody we could ask about it? Oh. Uh, I don't think people would get into stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not knocking any of it. I'm just saying, I myself, I'm not saying nothing. Mm -hmm. I, I would love to. Yeah. I mean, really. I, I mean, I, we it all would be. Yeah. That's why we're up here. Yeah. <laughs> Got kind Where was of this supposed stride. to be in at? Did, 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 did you know exactly? This was they... supposed to happen here. In like, Hellier. Yeah. Well, in Hellier we're not down exactly there. Sure if where... I could figure, that's what I'm trying to figure out. See, that's where I live. Okay. So, that's what I'm trying to figure. That's why I'm trying to look at the location. Dude was only here for like seven or eight months. Seven or eight months before you oh, said yeah. he had to. Probably around no, here. That'd I, be a good idea. You, uh, you, there's like you. Okay. Just watch out, man. Thanks, man. Watch yeah. Thank, Thank you. Man. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night, Just watch dude. yourself around here. Yep. What is happening? Why did he end the conversation? I think we know what that is. Yeah. Car actual yeah. number now? Call him. The guy in the blue shirt keeps walking back and forth. And he does. I mean, not in a bad way. I'm just curious. Hello. Hi, can I speak to Tammy? Hey Tammy, my name's Greg Newkirk. I don't know if you remember me or not, but we met about a year and a half ago. Yeah, talking about weird prints. Yeah, how are you? I'm fine, how are you? I'm fantastic. We, uh, I came and I brought some friends to town and we were poking around, kind of looking into weirdness again. I was wondering if you'd heard anything new. Four days. I'm sorry, so I've been trying to get a hold of a grandson. 
Oh man, we would love to talk to him if he's into talking to us. He got all the hills, he can take you up in the hill. Oh, that's exactly what we're looking for. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Alright, we'll talk soon. Here, like what half an hour and now we got weird footprints to go check out got a guy who us in the hills it was like that of course now you know i don't want to trust everybody yeah. god that's obvious what did you say mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. he's like hey come here so, well, just you know, be careful who you trust me. Yeah. Be careful who you trust. You know, if somebody starts leading you off somewhere and you say you know something, don't follow them. No, him. no. So you'll know. You can tell. You can tell these good people mm -hmm. and not. Yeah. But again, nobody knows who they Yeah. Nobody has any idea. Never heard the name. He I mean, was in and out pretty fast. He was fast. Like, mm -hmm. you know. No, I ain't never seen nothing like that. The way we uh, do research in these things, and we've heard so many reports from this town, we just had to come out and see what's yeah. going on. She said y'all was your... This guy's been, he was here about a year and a half ago. About a year ago. and a half ago. Yeah. Yeah. Did around. you find anything? We were only here for the day. We only just came to kind of scope it out to plan a trip to come back and actually spend more time here. Several years well, ago. Well, I'm going to tell you something I don't believe. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that did. I'm I don't go, believe hit, man went to me. the moon. Really? Shit, no. Why do you say that? Why well, can't you go to the sun? Burn up. Okay, how you know the moon ain't too cold? We don't know that. Yes, that's don't. true. Yeah. Huh. I just stuff some stuff I can believe, some stuff I, I just can't. So you you know I just don't thank God ten for nobody land on the moon. Cause they there's other supposed to be other planets closer than the moon. Sure. Well how come they ain't went to them? But now for a doctor I don't know. I don't know no doctors around here. Well, Nobody who ever like seven or eight months. Yeah. From the sounds of it. No, not not from here. Yeah. Anybody here ever just kind of get up and leave, and all their stuffs left there, and they just left and never come back? I don't know nobody ever done that. Yeah. Who did you say it was? David M. Christie, Doctor David M. Christie, supposedly. I, I never hear that. Yeah. From here. Nope. Nobody heard of him last time I was here. No. I think somebody was uh, using a fake name. I'd say you're probably right by. I mean, we know that there's we know that there's been UFO sightings a few years ago. Last time we were here, people were talking about Bigfoot and little creatures well, and ghosts and stuff like that. Well, you know, I'm not saying that you probably would find stuff that you don't know what it is in the hills around here. You know what I'm saying? This is what he says is a picture of one of the creatures. We kind of figure it looks a little like that. Did you all travel everywhere? Everywhere, looking for stuff like this. But you ain't never found nothing. We found lots of okay, stuff. Okay, now what would you do if you ran up on it? <laughs> we'd, take, <laughs> we'd take better pictures. <laughs> I know what I'd be doing. I'd be a moving on. <laughs> well, that's think. what this guy did. So the, the first night we talked with a few people in the parking lot, and it was kind of what I was expecting. We talked to someone who um, had a few stories about maybe weirdness, but nothing too specific. Uh, and then another guy who didn't really have any experiences there, but was very interested in us and what we were doing. And then, you know, warning us about being safe uh, in the area because it's not necessarily a super safe place. But I think that we left uh, kind of a little bummed out sort of because it was like we were kind of getting details, but there wasn't really anything specifically. So we kind of left, I felt a little defeated sort of like we were, as if it chased us out a little bit. You know what I mean? Like I felt like it didn't at that time want us to be there because everything was against us. The sun was going down. Um, the people were kind of super suspicious of us. We were feeling wiped out from the drive and then also kind of apprehensive about being there because again, new location, sketchy people, sketchy environment. So it was as if we kind of like showed up and like were, had a little experience that really didn't pan out into anything and then kind of left with our tails between our legs a little bit. We had to go somewhere and um, regroup and think about how we were going to reapproach what we were doing there. 
as silly as it sounds, the one weird thing about that night was the fact that no one would give us anything weird. Like that was strange in and of itself considering the first time we were there, we had in the same spot, no less, we had all of these people telling us all this stuff about UFOs flying above the town and, and ghosts and all, like all sorts of things that I was surprised that, you know, having been there for the same amount of time that we kind of had a, a few interesting, maybe leads sort of, but for the most part, people were like, no, not really. I don't, we don't really have any of that kind of stuff here. It seemed like a totally different town, um, completely different than the first time. While we were sitting around, Dana thought it might be a cool idea to do a tarot spread, just to kind of give us an idea. You know, we were sitting there planning the weekend and the rest of the expedition. Maybe it would help you know, set uh, an idea in our head about what to expect for the weekend. We shuffle on. Yeah, you go. <laughs> the thing I like about tarot, I'm like I don't know how to read tarot. I know some, I know some interpretations, but I don't ever really. Typically do it because Danny's pretty good at it. What I like is that it kind of forces you, regardless of whether you believe that there's any kind of real power in tarot or, uh, you know, it's just a fun diversion. It forces you to approach a situation differently. You have to when you see the cards. You have to sit there and think more deeply about the situation you're in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was pretty obvious. There's also a fun saying in tarot, which is why when something pops out, you're supposed to use it. It's what falls to the floor comes to your door. <laughs> there we go. That's really weird. So let's do one more. These cards are just, again, mirroring a lot of what we were already talking about. I feel like this one just jolted right over. So Which way? This way. Oh, the devil. Wow. This is a really shitty reading. <laughs> <laughs> so often the Hierophant is described as kind of, it, it kind of sits somewhere between judgment and, um, and kind of the devil a little bit. It's a, it's a card of um, establishment. It can often represent um, the way things are supposed to be, sometimes faded. Um, Five of Cups is the second card, which is, again, a really sad card, which is, it's a lot similar to uh, some of the other cards that we've pulled, where it's, it's a guy who's, instead of realizing that he has two cups that are still full, he's focused on the three cups that aren't full. And it's, again, same kind of situation here. And th this is such a sad card because he, this person doesn't realize that they still have because they're too focused on what they don't have anymore. And then the devil is the card of ego. It's the card of um, manipulation and um, division and uh, misuse of power and mm. Again, if we're talking about this area, it's probably something that happens a lot here. This card, I feel, probably resonates the most with me with, in regards to the place that we're in. I mean, it's not less in some way, is it, right? Like, to apply it in terms of, like, 
like are we the ego and like manipulating a, a situation that's just like sad and not parent like maybe that's like guilty conscience thinking for me but but I don't know I see that card and I think of somebody like Terry Wrist because mm-hmm. you see this big powerful character that everyone has all of these you know thoughts and ideas about with these people chained up right underneath of them. So then if we look at it from that perspective, what we can see is information being given to us Mm -hmm. and we're looking in the wrong direction. There's still information. But we're looking at the wrong thing. But we're looking at the wrong thing because we are living in his world. We're seeing three empty cups right now. Instead of of the two full cups. This, this, you become the devil when you want to manipulate people, when you want things your way, when your ego becomes so big that it's, you know, it's your, your version of reality becomes everyone else's version of reality. And I mean, to a certain extent that could apply because making a documentary is about filtering reality in a certain way so that other people observing it, see it your way, right? Um, So yeah, we definitely could be the devil. But it's a lot more sinister though. The thing is, <laughs> it's, it's the devil's, it's more about like um, arrogance and ego and, and it's, it comes from more of a malicious place rather than wanting to share information. It's an uncomfortable reading for an uncomfortable place. Yeah. That's a really good way to put it. Yeah. There's something off here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In this kind of a place, a place that in all of our combined research, we agree that this is an open window to something else this town is. It takes somebody to be here with an open mind in order to experience things, and so much of the town doesn't have that. Mm-hmm. We haven't found people yet that, mm-hmm. that do, but I think we will. We're, we're here long enough. So after that, we sat down, we pulled out all of our material, we kind of decided what the best course of action would be for the first full day we would have in town. And that consisted of calling the local newspaper, seeing if they'd ever had any strange reports, um, calling the local police department, uh, just calling anybody we thought might have some information. Uh, So what I did is uh, I spent that night, I, I emailed the local news station and um, then the next day we got to beat in the street. We got five minutes to check out. So like we could go sit in the car and make the calls. We yeah. could go down Let's to the that. restaurant. And yeah, we got five calls. minutes. So. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We could take some of your bags and stuff, help you out. Cool. Sounds good. Uh, yeah. The reaction of the media agencies was incredibly unusual. Uh, one of the, th- the fun things about being a paranormal investigator is Unlike a lot of different professions, if you roll into town and you start asking questions, people want to give you answers. They're interested. Even if they're not completely sold that what you're doing is valid, they think the story's so interesting, they're more than willing to help. I've never really ran into many uh, situations where people weren't just ready to bend over backwards to be part of a strange tale. You know, something to talk about at the bar. Hey, I met a paranormal investigator today and he's looking into this or this. This was totally different. Um, The local police department didn't answer at all. I'm sorry, that call is not available. Left numerous messages with different departments of the local police station. Hello, my name is Greg Newkirk. I'm a paranormal investigator based out of Cincinnati, and I'm spending a few days here in the Pikeville area investigating a case I was put onto by a man from Hellier. None of which were returned. Uh, Through the entire expedition, none of them were returned. I'm sorry, that call is not available. Every single department line that we called was dead. Nobody answered. So it's impossible to get anybody at the police department, which is really weird. The local uh, news station 
was completely disinterested. Thank you so much. Uh, can I give you my number in case it rattles anything loose at the office? And suggested we call the local radio station. So we called the local radio station and they kind of blew it off and said, oh, you know, it's September. We're working on a, a Halloween piece. You should really talk to the people who put together the fluff piece. If, if you hear anything or anybody knows anything, it'd be great to hear from you. So there was zero interest and zero help. That was like a very reoccurring weirdness, was a lack of weirdness, you know, in and of itself, that's strange. And so to have all of these people kind of blowing us off or not engaging with us on the subject matter was bizarre. And we found that that morning was frustrating because there was just tons of that. Like we were calling and calling and no one was either answering, returning our calls or, you know, wanting to talk to us about the paranormal. If it's anything paranormal is happening in that area. That would be fantastic. Thank you so much for your help. Take care. Though David in his emails never said his address, he never explained where his house was with any sort of relation to any other landmark other than being slightly outside of the town of Heldier, there were some telltale signs about his property. He mentioned that there was a an old mine entrance on the edge of his property, that he had a shed, that they had a back porch that had a back porch light, and that his house was far enough away from his neighbors that he could go days without seeing a single other living being other than his family. So we did a lot of kind of boots on the ground where we were literally just driving the streets looking for anything that could potentially have looked like his house, any house that looked like the one that we originally saw. And that was uh, blowing up and down, you know, mountain roads and, and talking to anybody who would potentially talk to us. What Greg says, this like that gas station was kind of the edge of edge of Hellier proper. So rolling through here, this is probably it, and we'll be out of it in like 60 seconds. If there's even anything to speak of. It's not that bad. I mean, it's nice. It's relatively quiet. That was Hellier. Yeah. Um, there's a fork that we passed. There's a couple places there that, I'm trying to remember exactly which one it was, but we went up to and saw the house. Uh, but there's a fork back there that Dana seems to think might be it. I feel like it is, I could be wrong, but it looked like there were a bunch of houses up that road. So um, I, think, I think at this point it's just, let's go and cruise up some roads and see what we see and stir up the locals too yeah and then uh maybe after that you know if we if we find it obviously we can pull over but if not we can maybe reconvene back at the gas station again before we go yeah get to the b&b perfect i like it cool like it a lot i mean i don't know why you'd move down here without some connection here but if he was a doctor Maybe he had some sort of family connection to like some place back up in here. And like, if he was like sketched out by it, maybe he just drove into Pikeville for his grocery all the time instead of stopping at next door. And then no one ever really knew him, and he was only here for seven months or eight months. And then he bounces out, like, no one ever knew him to remember him. It's possible. It doesn't seem unfeasible.
So our first time in Hellier, we found a house that seemed to fit David's description. I mean, at the time, it had the right feel to it, but, you know, who knows? Uh, that was two years ago, and we couldn't remember exactly where it was. The area is covered with mountain roads, and they go for miles, and some of them are dirt, and you don't know exactly where you're going to end up. Uh, so right away, we started to realize it was going to be really tricky trying to find that house again, if it was even David's house to begin with. It wasn't until later that we realized we actually have footage of this house. Uh, but while we were there, it, we were going by memory, so we had no idea how to actually get there. The problem with looking for David's house is there were a ton of houses that could have fit the bill. Uh, a lot of them were currently lived in, but nearly everybody had a shed in the back of the house. Some of the houses that looked lived in looked abandoned. And one of the biggest issues we were running into was almost everybody had a mine on the edge of their property. The entire mountains were full of them. In fact, a lot of the roads that these people lived on were old mining roads that people had settled on because they worked the mine at the end of the road and that's just where they stayed. So all of these places could have been David's place. So after that point, we decided to start asking around. Does anyone know this guy? Does anyone know David? How you doing? All right, you? Pretty good. I was wondering if you guys might be able to help us out a little bit. We're in town, we're paranormal investigators, and we were called to town because there was a guy from around Hellier who said that he was finding strange footprints and they were coming out of an old cave or a mine shaft or something on the edge of his property. What was his name? His name was David Christie. David Christie? Yeah. Oh, no, around no one around here does. But he sent all these photographs of these strange things, and then have, one have day you he got just kind of. Uh, picture maybe of his property you can show me? I might be able to help you that way. Not of his he, property. Did he have an address? Uh, he didn't give us an address. We didn't get that far. I exchanged a whole bunch of emails with him, and then one day he just kind of up and left, and then all kinds of other weird stuff. Yeah, he just sent us uh, pictures of like what looked like three toed footprints in a uh, creek bed, sort of. And a, and a old abandoned mine on his edge of yeah, his Yeah, he said it was like a mine or a cave or something like that. Some kind of entrance. And I know this place is just filled with that yeah, type of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, There's all kinds of old mine entrance, right? Yeah. Hmm. Um, but I never heard of a Christie. You know, yeah, no Dave, one knows him. I don't think that's his real name. Dave, uh... He said he was a doctor. That was one thing. He said he was a doctor and he was new to the area. As far as I know, he was only here about seven months before he left. Hmm. I never heard of him. Hmm. You guys ever hear any any stories, any weird stories coming out of the mountains? Any stories of little little creatures or no. weird lights or anything like that? No. Well, there's a lot of weird stuff goes on here. The only, the only thing I've ever, as far as like what you're talking about, is we used to go down through your you get down here a big long straight piece down there yeah where it's got that well it's got that little switch back like that and it comes back into it right yeah. through there they used to say that they was uh you could hear of a night time a, a little cave or something or that you always hear like a baby crying or something over mm. there. really oh, mm. yeah. yeah coming from a cave coming from yeah a little bit so like not no big cave it was a little small place but huh. it was wild you could, wow that's cool and there are noises that come out it's of it it's been there for years i mean hmm. yeah when i was a yeah, I mean, that's uh, that's the only thing prior to like what you're talking oh. about. I mean, as far as a doctor living around here, if he would have had lived down there around the mouth of Holler in one of them places down there, because I I don't know. I don't know no Christians at all. No, I've never heard of one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did, uh, they didn't give you any case? The, the two gentlemen we were talking to were extremely helpful. 
uh, it was a the common theme. These guys, you know, you come at these guys with a strange story and they kind of look at the stuff and go, wow, that's, that's weird. Well, how can we help? The one piece of information they gave us, which ended up being something that, that hinged a lot on whether we believe that this case had any truth to it at all, was the fact that the footprints looked like they were made in slurry. That's a really interesting detail because slurry only comes out of abandoned mines that have blown out. So these guys were old coal miners. They knew what this stuff looked like. They worked around this stuff. They had this stuff on their properties. And they said the way that slurry happens is when uh, an old mine that has been blocked off and boarded up is flooded. That's how they keep people from going out of it, how they keep all the crap from flowing out. But eventually, after years and years and years, this stuff, the water actually pushes so hard on that blockage that one day it's going to blow out and all of the old coal is going to mix with the mud and it's going to wash out and almost kind of look like a, like a, a muddy black beach. These guys said this looks like coal slurry, so it's probably from somewhere around here. You just have to find a bed that's about as wide as this. Could there be something like that around? Oh, there could be, yeah. And building stuff on Native American land. And you know, like the that. other thing that I was thinking about listening to them talk about a baby crying to yep. is like a common, you know, thing that often happens like around elementals or like nature spirits is that there's kind of a level of like trickery, right? It feels very trying very to, Trying to get you to go into a certain place, knowing how to play on it. Probably shouldn't be. And it was coming out of a cave. That's what I mean. Like, your instinct as a human being, if you were a baby crying in a cave, would probably be. You want to go? Yeah, you can go check that. That's, there's, there's a lot of threads to follow from that guy. We decided to stay in a town nearby called Jenkins. It was about 20, 30 minutes away from Hellier. Uh, and it was a cabin. It was a cabin where we could all stay. We had a crew of five people. So it was a place where everyone could stay comfortably and it had a nice living room where we could kind of sit down and, and uh, at the end of the night reconvene and go over the stuff that we had learned. So we, we stayed at this cabin, uh, really cool place, nice and secluded. Um, no cell phone signal up there for most of us, no internet but it was a good place to have a little peace and quiet and a uh, kind of refuge from some of the craziness that we were investigating. First night we were there, we figured, well, we know that there's caves and mines all over the mountain that we're staying on. People have a million stories about this stuff and we're in the same area. We're staying in a lot of the same mountains. This is a phenomena that appeared at the time to be spread out around the place. Uh, people we would talk to outside of town had a ton of crazy stories. If these goblins that we're looking for or other beings are here in this community, you would expect that they would know that we're here. Um, and so why not go out and investigate them right at the place we were staying at? We were in town, we were in the area, and the woods were right there. So let's go see. So many different things. Talking about potential Native American spirits, aliens, goblins. It's all right in this area. And we've got, we're, we're the only people we can say with near certainty 
and I listen. Mm -hmm. And we're at the place that called out to you. Those emails went to you for a reason. Maybe that's this trip. Maybe that's to find out what's going on in this place. Because there's something. Maybe it's more than goblins. Yeah. <laughs> you know, maybe the goblins were just the key to getting people here. It's mm -hmm. just weird enough to get you here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how many ghost stories do you hear? Oh, tons. Exactly. And that's maybe, exactly it. Yeah. I mean, you guys know what that's like. Mm -hmm. You hear them all the time. So maybe that's the idea. Maybe there is something stranger than goblins here. Or more important than goblins here. And so we have the four of us that are there and we're extremely focused on getting some contact with whatever was, whatever was there. And I expected it to get pretty weird, but not quite as weird 